Hey church family, good morning. Pastor Jason here. It is so great to see you again. Listen, I want to say thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your investment. And thank you for serving at our grocery distribution yesterday. We had the opportunity to give away a tractor trailer load full of free groceries. And with our partnership with Kathy and the city of Huntsville and Huntsville City Schools and One Gen Away and Calhoun, we also gave away 750 backpacks full of school supplies for our neighbors in need. Listen, church family, you are making a difference in people's lives, and I'm so grateful. Thank you for supporting this vision that God has given us as a church. I also want to remind you next Sunday morning, we have our blessing of the backpacks. And I encourage you, bring your kids' backpacks to church. If you come in person at our Athens campus or our Harvest campus, we're doing this in all services. And we're going to have a special time of prayer for our kids in their new school year during the service. We're going to pray over backpacks, symbolically praying over our kids. And listen, if you work in a school system in any capacity at all, whether it's custodian, whether it's in nutrition, whether it's a teacher, a faculty member, an administrator, a bus driver, we want to bless you and pray over you as well as you prepare for this new school year. We hope to see you next Sunday morning in person at one of our campuses. Friends, let's pray together and let's dig into God's Word. Jesus, we love you. Thank you again for the opportunity to serve this community. God, we love Huntsville. We love the surrounding metro area. We love Athens and Limestone County. God, we love our state and we love the country and we love this world. And we're just so grateful for the opportunity to share the love of Jesus with people, to take care of physical needs and spiritual needs, just like you did, Jesus. Father, I pray for every person that came through yesterday. God, that you would just bless them. And God, give them hope today in Jesus' name. And Father, I pray for every person watching. God, I know that we live in a season and a time where uh, there just doesn't seem to be much hope. And so, God, I pray that you would give hope to every person that can hear the sound of my voice right now. Father, I know that talking about people's finances, it can be tough, it can be hard, and it can be uncomfortable. But God, your word has so much to say about our money. And God, I pray today we would have open ears and open hearts to what you have to say to us. God, I pray that you'd move me out of the way and that the words that come from my mouth, God, come directly from you. Jesus, we love you. We dedicate this time to you. And Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. If you're new with us today, we are in our third week of a study called Dollars and Cents. And we're trying to learn how to manage our money God's way, manage our finances with wisdom, because the Bible has a lot to say about our personal finances. Now, if you've missed the past two weeks, you may want to go back and watch those on our website. All of our teachings are available online for completely free. And all of these messages build on top of each other. And so I would encourage you, if you haven't seen week one and week two, go back and take a look. We learned in that first week that as Christians, we don't want to serve money. We want to serve Jesus, and we want our money to serve us as we are serving Jesus. And last week, we said if you want to truly have financial freedom, then we have to act our wage, amen. We've got to make sure that the money going out is not more than the money that's coming in. And today, I want to talk to you about saving money and about investing money, because I know that that's something for a lot of us we've really just never done, maybe other than just a savings account or a money market. I know that getting involved in investments, that that can be nerve wracking, but the Bible has so much to say about saving our money and investing our money. And so like we've done every other week, we're going to spend time in the scriptures and God's word, and then we want to unpack what God's word has to say. We're going to start in Proverbs, Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 8. It says, take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. 
So what we see in the Proverbs is we see this wisdom that if you look at how ants operate, even though they don't really have a ruler, someone telling them what to do, all summer long they work and they collect and they save so that that way when winter comes, when that winter season is there, they're taken care of. They have all the food they need so they can live and so that they can survive. And I really think the Bible speaks to that in our lives too. We've said before that emergencies will happen, unexpected things will happen. Those winter seasons are going to come in our lives as well. And so let's be prepared. Let's be ready. And so we don't have to panic. We don't have to operate in crisis. We can trust God and trust God's principles to make sure that we're prepared Another proverb is Proverbs 21, 20. The wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. Again, we see this wisdom from God's word that it is important to save our money. And so today I would encourage you, whether it's a savings account, whether it's a money market, if you don't have those things, you can go and get one at a bank, at a credit union, even online banks now. But we mentioned last week the importance of having an emergency fund. You can put that in a savings account and it can be there if you need it. Or maybe there's a financial goal that you have. We talked a little last week. Maybe it's saving for a car for a child. Maybe it's a college fund. Maybe it's retirement or a vacation that you want to take and pay cash for. Saving can be really powerful and we're going to learn how and why today. So let's answer the question, what will we save for? If the Bible says we need to save money, what do we need to save for? If you're taking notes, I believe that we need to save first for emergencies. We said before, emergencies are going to happen. The dishwasher is going to break and it's going to flood the house or your air conditioner is going to go out when it's 102 degrees outside or your car is going to break down unexpectedly or your toddler is going to swallow a quarter and you're going to have to go to the children's emergency room. These things happen. Remember what Jesus said. Jesus said, in this world we will have trouble, right? And that, that, that doesn't sound like a blessing. That doesn't sound very exciting. But when we know that Jesus said it, when Jesus makes us aware ahead of time, hey, just be prepared. There's going to be trouble in this life. Emergencies are going to pop up. The unexpected is going to happen. And Jesus said, take heart, I've overcome the world. And because Jesus has overcome the world, because Jesus has overcome our crises and our emergencies and the unexpected things that happen, we too can overcome. And part of that is by being prepared. We can also, number two, save for purchases. Don't just charge things to a credit card. We've talked about this over the past two weeks that the average American family has over $8,300 in just credit card debt. We're trying to keep up with the Joneses and frankly, we don't even like the Joneses, right? We're trying to put on this persona. I read an article the other day about some social media influencers who were taking photographs of themselves on luxury jets and they had their champagne and they had money sitting around the jet and they were posting it on their Instagram. And come to find out, they weren't really flying around on private jets at all. These were photography studios that were set up for influencers to come into and they were paying to have their picture made on a fake jet just so it could seem like they had a lot of money. We don't have to pretend if we act our wage, if we plan like we talked about diligently last week, we don't have to make all of our purchases on a credit card. Maybe you need that new couch. I would encourage you to save for it. Or that kitchen table or that new to you car. And then you can use cash to make those purchases without going into more and more debt. Now, there are some debt that's going to happen, right? For many people, a mortgage is going to be there. But when we can get rid of these little debts, when we can get rid of the $10,000 credit card payment, when we can get rid of all the car payment or the, the uh, scholarship, the, the uh, education loan, when we can get rid of those things, what it does is it begins to take the pressure out of off of us and we can save 
for those purchases. We can save for our needs, maybe not necessarily our greeds, but we can begin to save for those things. And then I would encourage you, number three, to save for the future. Maybe it's sending your kids to college. Maybe it's saving for braces as a kid becomes a teenager. Maybe it's saving for retirement, making sure you have what you need to pay your bills. Or maybe you have an idea of what you want retirement to be like. You want to travel or you want to be available to have an RV and go see grandkids, whatever that looks like for you. Maybe you need to save for the future and prepare. It's also important to understand that because trouble can happen, the unexpected can happen, emergencies can happen, as you're saving for retirement, also understand that you may be saving for future medical care. You may be saving so that if you have to be in an assisted living or a nursing home or something one day or even have a sitter come to your home, you're saving so that you have the resources available to take care of yourself if you need to do that. So we're going to save for emergencies, we're going to save for purchases, and we're going to save for the future. Here's the beautiful thing. There are two ways that you can make money, the Bible says. The first thing we need to understand is that people can make money. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says, Even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. It's biblical to have an income stream. It's even biblical to have multiple streams of income coming into your household. You can have a primary salary and secondary sources of income like hobby income or maybe you offer a service or you sell real estate or you blog or you write or you do affiliate marketing marketing, or maybe you teach online or teach adjunct classes for a local college or university. It's okay to have those multiple income streams as long as it's not interfering with the functioning of your family or interfering with that primary stream of income. Ecclesiastes 11.6 says, Plant your seed in the morning and keep busy all afternoon, for you don't know if profit will come from one activity or another or maybe both. See, even in Ecclesiastes, King Solomon, the wisest man in the world, talks about having multiple streams of income. And it doesn't have to be something that takes up a lot of time, especially with the internet. There are so many ways that you can have other income streams coming in and that will help you, whether it's paying off debt or whether it's saving or investing for some future financial goal that you have. The Bible says that King Solomon held a fortune that dwarfed any and every person that ever lived before him, making him one of the wealthiest people in the world. Even today, most scholars still believe that Solomon is by far the most wealthy man who ever lived on the earth in any time. They believe that his net worth today would be the equivalent of 2.1 trillion, trillion with a T, dollars. You see, when King Solomon became king of Israel, the country's borders stretched from Egypt to the Euphrates. Effectively, King Solomon controlled the movement of goods by land through Europe and Asia and African trade route. And that enabled Solomon to tax the movement of goods that flowed through caravans that came from Africa to Europe and Asia, from Europe to Africa and Asia, and from Asia to Europe in Africa. And he could tax it at whatever rate he desired. So each year, King Solomon received 25 tons of gold and much more. And this did not include income that he derived from business or his own trade or the annual tribute that people paid to him to, and all kings and governors in that part of the world. You see, even Solomon had multiple streams of income and it's okay to get creative. If you haven't watched last week, I encourage you to go back and watch it because we talk about things as simple as yard sales all the way up to maybe in this season of your life, you need to sell the RV. You need to sell an extra car that you have just to free up some income, make some space, have some margin so you're not totally stressed out. I mentioned this last week. But everyone on our staff here at church has multiple streams of income. 
if you've been around this for any amount of time, you know that we can only use 35% of our church budget on salaries. That means we rely on volunteers. We only have three full-time staff members and everybody else is part-time. And even our full-time staff members have multiple income streams and that's okay. We do what we have to do so we can do what God has called us to do and we love it. But you can get creative to make sure that you're taking care of everything that you need to take care of. There's also a second way to make money, and a lot of people don't realize it, or a lot of people are worried about it, or they're unsure of it, or scared of it, and that's that money makes money. Your money can actually make you money as well. And Jesus told a parable that illustrates this beautifully in Matthew 25. He said that a master gave five talents to one man and two talents to another. And to another man he gave a third, or one to a third. And the third person went out and buried the talent and got nothing. But the person with five talents, this is what Scripture says in Matthew 25, 16. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. So the person who only had the one talent went and buried it and uh, came back to the master and had what he was given. But the servant that had five bags of silver, five talents, went out and invested and made more money and was able to come back to the master and he had doubled his money. He had invested it. He had put it to work. You can work for money, but your money can also work to make money. And the good news is, is that when money works, it works 365 days a year. It works while you're awake. It works while you're asleep. And so I encourage you to consider investing as a way to meet those financial goals that you have. And I want to give you three quick rules from Scripture on investing. Believe it or not, these are in the Bible. The Bible talks about investing as well. And the first is this. That's if you're going to invest, you've got to do your research. Do your research. Proverbs 24, verses 3 through 4. A house is built by wisdom and becomes strong through good sense. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with all sorts of precious riches and valuables. You see, you need to understand what you are investing in. Don't invest in something just because someone told you to. You need to understand it. You need to have an understanding of, of what you're placing your money into. And you need to have an understanding of how it works, how you make money, what the interest rate is going to be. Don't just blindly put your money in investments. And if it's something you're interested in doing, I would encourage you. Organizations like Ramsey Solutions, Dave Ramsey's Crown Financial, Thriving, and others, they will help you do this in a way that is wise and they will help you do your research. We even have Dave Ramsey endorsed investment professionals in our communities and you can find that on their website. Do the work and do the research. The second thing we see in Ecclesiastes 11.2, but divide your investments among many places for you do not know what risks might lie ahead. The second thing we see here, if we're going to invest, you've got to diversify your portfolio, diversify your portfolio. Don't put all your money into one thing because if that one thing falls apart and there is disaster, then you're in a lot of trouble. Dave Ramsey, I read a quote from him. He says that investing is a lot like manure. If you put it all in one place, it starts to stink, but if you spread it out, it makes things grow. It's the same with our finances. And the third lesson, I believe, is probably the most important one, and one where we really need a heart check that we need to be aware of. If you're going to invest, number three, don't try to get rich quick. Don't do it. Proverbs 13, 11, wealth from get-rich-quick schemes quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. Even God said it. Money plus time, plus consistency equals wealth. Healthy things grow. And I would encourage you, if you're going to invest, do it the healthy way. 
Think about this for a minute. Say you're about 20 years old and you deposit $500 into an investment account. And then every year you put another $500 in it. Think about this. Think about this for the long term. Assuming a 12% return, which is possible if you will leave the money alone for long term. In about 50 years, you can have almost $1.5 million. You see, we try to get rich quick. We live in this fast food society, this mentality that we have to have what we want, when we want it, and when do we want it? We want it now. It's got to be right now. I talk to couples all the time that have just gotten married and they're in their early 20s. And they're making poor financial decisions because they want to live like their parents are living now. But it's taken their parents 25 to 30 years to build up their savings, to build up the finances, to be able to have the house or have the vehicles or go on the trips. And so I would encourage you, take a moment and check your heart and say, okay, God, I want to be able to do what you've called me to do. God, would you help me? Would you help show me? How do I need to save? How do I need to invest so that I can be everything you've called and created me to be? Now, saving and investments, it's important. But the greatest investment ever made in the history of the world was when God gave the biggest gift He's ever given. God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who was born without sin into a world filled with sin. Jesus made the perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins on a cross. He became sin. He shed His blood. He died on a cross, but friends, He rose again from the grave. God sent His Son while we were still sinners. Scripture says Christ died for us. You and I were born sinners. We're born separated from God. We say what we want. We think what we want. We do what we want. We sin. In a way, we try to be our own boss. We try to be our own God. And because of that, every one of us has a sin debt that needs to be paid. We can pay it ourselves. We can pay it ourselves with an eternity in a very real place called hell. Or we can allow Jesus to pay it for us. Jesus died on a cross and rose again, friends, to forgive us, to pay our sin debt, to redeem us and set us free. Jesus on that cross made forgiveness available to everyone, but it is only applicable when you choose to place your faith in Jesus Christ and make Him your Lord. Friends, I want to give you the opportunity to do that. The Bible says if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. I believe you can be saved today, forgiven. You can be given a home in heaven when you die, but right now while you're on this earth, you can walk with God each and every day. And I want to ask you if that's you, if you'd say, Jason, I want to make that decision today to follow Christ with my life. Would you pray this prayer with me right now? God, I've been going my own direction with my life and doing my own thing. God, I've been making my own decisions. I've been trying to be my own God, but today I realize I'm a sinner separated from you and I need a Savior. And God, I believe that Savior is your son, Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus died on a cross for me and I believe he rose again from the grave so that I could have a brand new life. God, today I ask you to forgive me and I ask you to change me and to send your spirit to live inside of me, to lead me and guide me every day. Jesus, you are my Lord, and I want to follow you for the rest of my life. And Jesus, it's in your name I pray. Amen. Listen, if that was you, congratulations. You are forgiven. You're changed. You have a brand new life. You have a home in heaven, and you have a God that loves you, that's going to walk with you each and every moment of each and every day on this journey called life. But I want to ask you, please, Don't change the channel. Don't turn this video off without letting us know. You can go to our website right now and click I'm new. Give me a name, an email address, a phone number, just some way to reach out to you. First, I want to pray for you by name and thank God for your salvation. And second, I want to send you resources, free resources that will help you grow in your faith, that will help you become more and more like Jesus. 
so you can be everything he created you to be. We love you here. We're praying for you. And if there's ever any way that we can specifically pray for something going on in your life, or maybe you're watching and you're not local to North Alabama, and you'd say, I'd really love to find a church home. We believe that is important for you to have a local church family. Let us know. We'll do everything we can to try to help you find a life-giving, Jesus-centered church close to your home and your community. Friends, we love you. If you need us, don't hesitate to reach out. And I hope to see you in person next week for the blessing of the backpacks. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for these who are watching and listening. God, I know I don't know everything that's going on in their lives, but I acknowledge that you do. And Father, I ask you to be people's great physician, to be their wonderful counselor, to be Jehovah Jireh, their provider, to be Jehovah Shalom, their peace. God, would you meet people right where they're at today and do what only you can do? Because we believe, Jesus, that anything is possible with you. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. 